We have with us today Jeffrey Sussman, who's the author of 13 nonfiction books. Correct. Correct. And the most recent is the one that he's here to talk about today, which is Boxing and the Mob, The Notorious History of the Sweet Science. Jeffrey is also the author of two other books about boxing, and in addition to his writing, he runs a successful PR and marketing company that represents small and mid-sized businesses. Please welcome Jeffrey Sussman. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Is this too loud? Am I too close to this microphone? How was that? Is that good? Yeah. Um, how many of you are interested in boxing, and how many are, are interested in the mob, and how many are interested in both? <laughs> Is this both? Yeah. Both. Okay. Um, I, I ha have always been interested in boxing ever since I was uh, uh, twelve years old. When my I was a skinny little kid, and, and uh, my father was an amateur boxer, and he. Uh, he taught me the elements of boxing. He brought home one day a pair of boxing gloves, a jump rope, a, a speed bag, and a heavy bag, and he set them up in the basement and gave me uh, boxing lessons. And then he was uh, a friend of um, men in Lou Stillman, who owned a famous boxing gym in New York City. And he uh, took me over there and signed me up for 10 boxing lessons with a, with a, a professional uh, middleweight boxer. And um, I, I I became a little full of myself after that because uh, I said to the uh, to the uh, guy who was teaching me boxing, and here I was, this skinny little twelve-year-old. I said, "I'd like to get in the ring and and, and box with someone." <clears throat> and he said, "What are you crazy? You'll get your head beaten." Then. <laughs> and but but my my father also uh, introduced me to somebody when I was uh, thirteen years old, an uncle of his named Irving, and. Uh, it, it, it was at uh, my bar mitzvah, and uh, the first, it was the one and only time I met this uh, uh, man named uh, Irving. And uh, my father introduced me to him, and he handed me an envelope with a lot of money in it. And I never saw Irving again. And afterwards, I asked my father, who is Irving? You know, it, it, it turned out that he was my father's uncle. I uh, didn't see him very often. He had become a... Uh, multi-millionaire during Prohibition, he was a bootlegger. And my father's family was rather poor during the Depression. And Irving had a big mansion up, uh, in upstate New York next to Avril Harriman's mansion, uh, with, uh, who was the governor of New York in the 1950s. And uh, during the Depression, he invited my father over there a few times, but he never uh, gave my father's family any financial help. But what he did is he told my father how to bet on fixed fights. So, so he told him to bet on a, uh, my father told me the first one he bet on was a, a fight with a, a fighter named Jack Sharkey. And Irving told him bet $75 on it and, and you, you'll make $750. And then the next time he bet, he bet on a fighter uh, named Primo Carnero. And, 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 and he doubled or tripled his money and he kept doing that. Uh, at, on the advice of, 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 of Irving. So I became fascinated uh, not only by boxing, but also about fixed fights. A and um, my, my father told me that so many of, of the uh, of boxing matches during the 1930s and 40s were fixed. And, uh, and, and the public didn't know about it, uh, uh, much of this. So I started doing a, a lot of research in, into the subject. And I, and I started off by examining a man named Arnold Rothstein, who was really the, uh, the founder of organized crime in America as we now know it. Um, his protégés, uh, who came to him to learn how to be organized criminals, were uh, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, uh, Bugsy Siegel, and Frank Costello, who were all uh, boyhood pals. And, 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 and they all uh, worked together under Arnold Rothstein. Now, Arnold Rothstein fixed the 1919 World Series, the famous Black Sox scandal. And um, his uh, bag man in that was a man named A. Vittel, who had been the featherweight boxer, uh, boxing champion from 1906 to 1912. And after uh, the fix was discovered and, and, and received a great deal of notoriety, um, 
Ava Talbot was indicted and brought into a court in, in uh, Chicago. And he had a lot of moxie. He was able to convince the judge and the jury that he was the wrong Ava Tell, that it was somebody else named Ava Tell. And they dismissed him, and, and he walked out of the courtroom. Um, but Abe and Arnold uh, realized after this event that it would be a lot easier to fix a boxing match than a baseball game. Because in a baseball game, you have to fix nine players. In, in a boxing match, you only have to fix one boxer and maybe a judge. Um, and, and so Ava Tell got very involved with, with fixing fights. And uh, Arnold Rothstein was killed in a, a, at the site of a, a, a poker game at the Park Central Hotel in 1928. And after his demise, his four protégés took over uh, all the enterprises that he was involved in. And they all uh, got involved heavily in uh, bootlegging. And, and one of the people that they partnered with was a, um, a transplanted English gangster named Oni Madden, also known as Oni the Killer Madden, because he, he had previously been a member of a gang called the Gophers, and he had killed a number of people and served uh, time in Sing Sing prison. After Prohibition ended, uh, when Roosevelt became president, uh, Oni Madden, who had become very, very wealthy from bootlegging, needed something else. Uh, to make money from. And though he had incidentally been involved in, in boxing matches in a small way, he decided to get involved in a big way. And he bought a 50% interest in a, an Italian a boxer who had really started out as a circus strongman named Primo Carnero, who was brought to the United States by his uh, French manager. And only man who saw this as an opportunity uh, to, to make a lot of money. Primo Carnero looked like a heavyweight champion. He, he was probably the biggest boxer there, there ever was. He, I think he was six foot seven and, and, and weighed about 265 pounds. But he couldn't box. And, and, and Abe Tell had to give him lessons uh, to, to make it at least passable that, that, that he could box. Well, only Madden threatened to, to kill the, the uh, French manager. So he left the United States and went back to France. And Oni Madden and his cohorts took over the complete contract of, of, of Primo Carnero. And they fixed every single one of his fights uh, until they got him to be the uh, heavyweight champion of, 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 of the world. And they were making millions and millions of dollars from him. In uh, 1935, he fought uh, a heavyweight uh, contender named Max Baer. And, uh, at that time, uh, Thomas Dewey was going after a lot of the mob figures uh, in New York, and there was a lot of heat on Oni Madden. And he figured it was a good time to get out of boxing. So he didn't even try to fix the fight with Max Baer and uh, Primo Carnero. Uh, Max Baer beat up Primo Carnero pretty badly. He knocked him down 11 times and, and, and broke a few of his ribs. He, he, uh, he broke a, a bone in his forearm and in his jaw. And, and, the, and the mob completely dropped Primo Carnero. They, they, they took all of his money, they left him penniless and, and, and in the hospital. Max Baer felt so badly about what he had done to a, a Primo Carnero that he paid all of uh, uh, Primo Carnero's hospital bills. And then went on to get uh, Primo Carnero a career as a professional wrestler. And, and Primo was able to make back all of the money uh, that the mob had stolen from him. And he was eternally grateful uh, to, to Max Baer. I don't know if any of you saw the movie Cinderella Man. Well, it, 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 it's a completely inaccurate uh, uh, portrayal of Max Baer. In that movie, he comes across as a, a sadistic, boorish, loud, uh, very, very unattractive person. He, he was a very kind, he was a very gentle man. When, when he died in 1950, Primo Carnero uh, was in Italy and couldn't get to California for the funeral. He arrived a week later and it was late at night and he had his driver take him to the cemetery where uh, Max Baer was buried. And the cemetery gates were locked and they climbed over the fence. They located uh, uh, Max's uh, gravestone and Primo Carnero bent down, uh, said a prayer and crossed himself and then he said to his driver, Max Baer was the best friend I ever had. 
um, and, 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 and this kind of portrayal. I, I interviewed uh, Max Baer's son, Max Baer Jr., who was in that TV show, The Beverly Hillbillies. Um, and uh, he was so upset at the portrayal of his father in uh, Cinderella Man that he, he, won, he tried to sue Ron Howard. But you can't sue, can't defame a dead person. So he had no grounds for, for bringing the lawsuit. But when he did question Ron Howard, Ron Howard said to him, well, we needed a, 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 a villain, uh, and, and, and we chose him. We, we made uh, Jimmy Brown the good guy, and we made your father the bad guy. Tough. Uh, but but, but that, that was totally inaccurate. And um, to, to, to get back to Oni Madden, Oni Madden uh, retired to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and he turned it into a, a resort for, for mobsters. So that when Thomas Dewey um, indicted uh, Lucky Luciano for uh, prostitution, Lucky Luciano hightailed it to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and hid out there for a year until he was finally extradited <coughs> and, and brought back to New York. Um, Oni, Oni Madden uh, became sort of legitimate in Hot Springs, uh, married the, uh, the postmaster's daughter, and, 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 and ran a, a hotel for, for, for mobsters who wanted to go to a resort or, or on the land from the law or, 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 or just wanted to remake themselves. And in his last few years, he became quite ill and he required round-the-clock nursing care. And so he needed a woman to come in and take care of him 24 hours a day. And the woman who did that, who was his round-the-clock nurse, uh, was Bill Clinton's mother, uh, who uh, 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 took care of uh, Oni Madden in, in his last days. Now, now, after Oni Madden left, a man named Mike Jacobs, who, who was very entrepreneurial, uh, he started out with nothing, and, and he, uh, he became a ticket promoter, and, and the ticket promotion led to him eventually being able to control Madison Square Garden and, and all the fights that, uh, that, that, that took place. And, and he owned the, uh, the contract of Joe Lewis and, and, and set it up that as long as Joe Lewis remained uh, world heavyweight boxing champion, Mike Jacobs would get 10% of everything that uh, Joe Lewis earned. So Mike Jacobs was very careful to make sure that Oni Madden's, uh, that, that uh, Joe Lewis's opponents were not as good as uh, 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 Joe Lewis, because he wanted him to remain the world heavyweight boxing champion for as long as possible. Um, in the 1940s, uh, Mike Jacobs had uh, two strokes, and, and, and he retired to his uh, mansion in New Jersey. In, 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 incidentally, I, I gave a talk uh, about uh, Max Fair and Mike Jacobs and some of these people uh, two years ago when, when another boxing book came out and, and uh, Max uh, Jacobs' uh, niece came to, to my talk and she came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, everyone in our family hated him. He was the meanest, cheapest son of a bitch that you can imagine. And we were so happy when he died. And, and I couldn't believe that she said this to me. Um, anyway, um, in, in uh, Mike Jacobs' absence, uh, there was a void, and the void was filled by a man named Frankie Carbo. Frankie Carbo had been a murder, murder incorporated, and in Murder Incorporated, he had killed 19 people. One of his partners in Murder Incorporated was uh, Bugsy Siegel, who was a close friend of his. Uh, in, in case you don't know it, um, uh, there was a gang prior to Murder Incorporated called the, uh, uh, the Bug and Meyer Gang which was Bugsy Siegel and Meyer Lansky. And, uh, and, and, and it was one of the most vicious gangs in, in, in New York in the teens. And when they moved on and became protégés of uh, Arnold Rothstein, uh, what they had formed evolved into what was later known as Murder Incorporated, which was a gang of about 100 uh, Jewish and Italian uh, mobsters operating out of Brownsville, Brooklyn. And, and they killed people for hire. They were retained uh, by um, two uh, major gangsters, uh, uh, Albert, I mean, Mad Hatter Anastasia, and uh, a man, um, I'm trying to think of his name, um, Lepke Bookholder. Uh, the two of them were partners. Lepke Bookholder, um, 
who was eventually indicted and tried for murder by Thomas Dewey, and he is the only uh, mob boss who's ever been electrocuted or, or sentenced to death in, 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 in New York. Um, and he and Albert Anastasia ran Murder Incorporated. Uh, they paid all of the uh, members of Murder Incorporated a retainer. Uh, they could only kill people that they were ordered to kill. And then for each killing, they got a, a, a separate fee on top of that. And uh, there was a, uh, uh, a gangster, um, what's his name I'm trying to recall? Uh, Abe Reynolds, uh, also uh, nicknamed Kid Twist. Uh, and he was uh, flipped by the government, and he was testifying against uh, Bugsy Siegel and Albert Anastasia and Lucky Book Coulter and all of these people, and Frank Costello, and they were very, very worried. And uh, the prosecution put him up in a uh, hotel in Coney Island <clears throat> called the Half Moon Hotel. And uh, he was supposed to testify uh, against uh, these mob bosses. And he was being guarded by six New York City policemen. And uh, one day he, he was thrown out of the window, out of the six-story window of the Half Moon Hotel. And, and, and the mobsters used to joke that he was a canary, but he was a canary who couldn't fly. <laughs> and, and it turned out that Frank Costello had paid the six uh, policemen uh, $100,000 to split between them for, for throwing uh, red rebels out the window. And, and, and nothing ever happened to the six. They were all demoted uh, to a lower rank, but they, they split $100,000. And that's at a time when cops were, you know, if they were lucky, they were making $3,000 a year. Uh, so it, it was beneficial to them. So, so a after this passed and, and this problem, uh, uh, Frankie Carbo uh, decided to, uh, to get involved in boxing. It, 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 that Murder Incorporated was a little too hot for him. And he partnered with a man named Frank Blinky Palermo, who was the numbers king of uh, Philadelphia. And they partnered with a very, very wealthy man named Jim Norris, whose family at the time owned the Chicago Merchandise Mart and a number of uh, sports teams. And he, uh, Jim Norris loved hanging around gangsters and boxers and, and was thrilled to become a partner of, of theirs. Their fourth partner, oddly enough, was a man named Truman Gibson. Truman Gibson had been, uh, was a prominent black civil rights lawyer, and he had been hired by Harry Truman after World War II to integrate the armed forces. And he was also Joe Lewis's uh, lawyer and, 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 and did all of his contracts. Well, the four of them uh, formed a partnership. Truman Gibson did the law work. Jim Norris supplied all the funds that they needed. And um, Frankie Carbo and, uh, and Blinky Palermo um, forced people to sign with them. They controlled every uh, middleweight and welterweight fight that took place in Madison Square Garden. And probably the most famous fight that they fixed was the one of uh, uh, Jake LaMotta. Have you seen the movie Bridging Bull? But, well, uh, 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 Frankie Carbo was portrayed in, in, in that uh, movie as a kind of shadowy figure who, who uh, goes to uh, uh, Jay Kamada to get him to, uh, to, to throw a fight against a uh, fight against Billy Fox. And originally, uh, Jake didn't want to do this. Uh, Jake thought he could become the middleweight champion on his own. And he was known in boxing circles as the undeclared middleweight champion. But they would never give him a, a title fight. And uh, Carbo said to him, look, if you want to have a title fight, you're going to have to go along with us. We'll pay you $100,000, and, and, and we'll arrange for you to have a, a, a title fight. So finally, uh, Lamar agreed. And not being an idiot, he bet the $100,000 on his opponent uh, to, to win. <laughs> and, 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 and he lost. And it was apparent to everyone who saw the fight that he was intentionally losing. He hardly put up much of a defense. And, and, and people in the audience were yelling, fix, fix, <coughs> and, 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 and all kinds of other things. And uh, Jake had, uh, I think it was either five or six additional fights after that. And they finally gave him a shot at, at, at the middleweight title. 
and he fought a, a French middleweight champion named Marcel Sudan, and he beat him. And uh, Marcel Sudan was the fiancé of that a famous French singer named uh, Edith Piaf. Mm -hmm. And he was flying back to New York for a rematch with, with uh, Lamada, and his plane crashed in the Azores, killing him. And, and that ended the possibility of a, of, of, of a rematch there. Um, also, uh, beginning in, in the early 1950s, uh, televised boxing matches started becoming very popular. In New York, there, there, there were the Friday night fights and the Wednesday night fights. And, and there was a, a, a man who was a very good boxing trainer and manager named Ray Arcel, who started broadcasting boxing matches from Boston on Saturday nights. And uh, Carbo and Palermo were very unhappy about this. They wanted to control all the televised boxing matches. And they threatened Arcel a few times. And uh, he didn't uh, acquiesce. And so they sent a thug up to, uh, to Boston. And while Arcel was on his way to the Boston Arena one night, this thug came up behind him with a lead pipe wrapped in newspaper and smashed him over the head, fractured his skull. And, and he was in the hospital uh, for four weeks. And he was told that if he ever got involved in boxing again, they would kill him. And oddly enough, uh, many years later, the manager of Roberto Duran felt that his fighter needed a good trainer in order to become a successful champion. And he went to Ray Arcel. And he, and he said, would you train Roberto? I think you're the only one who can train him to become a champion. And, and this created a dilemma for Ray because he knew that if he got involved in boxing, he would be killed. So he said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, but I'm not going to take any money uh, for it. And he went to the mobsters in New York and he, and he told them this. And they said, well, as long as you're not taking any money, it's OK. And, 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 and he trained Roberto Duran and made him a champion. Um, but um, they, they also tried to uh, control Sh uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. And he was the only fighter who really stood up against them. He, he was considered the best pound for pound boxer who ever lived, and probably in the 20th century. And he was so good. He also negotiated his own contracts. He, he was a very tough negotiator. And, and uh, Carver kept trying to get him involved. And, and, and he wouldn't go along. And there was nothing the mother could do, they just let him be. There was another fighter named uh, Carmen Basilio who uh, wanted to become the middleweight uh, uh, a champion. And, and actually, he, he beat uh, Sugar Ray Robinson in their first fight and, 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 and became the champion. And they want, uh, uh, Carbo and Palermo wanted money from him uh, uh, to do this. And he said, I'm not going to give you any money. He said, if my manager wants to give you money, that's fine, but I'm not going to give you money. So I've worked hard to achieve what I've gotten so far. And he came from a very poor upstate family of um, onion farmers in upstate New York. And he had spent his, his teenage years digging onions out of the ground. And, and he hated it. And, 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 and boxing was a way out of poverty for him. And he wasn't about to give up a, a nickel uh, to, uh, to these gangsters. And he went to his manager and he said, I'm not doing it. He, he, he said, if you want to give him some money, you give him money. But I'm not giving him money. So the manager wanted uh, Carmen to have a uh, championship fight, so the manager paid $30,000 so, so that Carmen could have this, uh, the, the, this fight, and he won. Now, uh, Palermo and um, Carbo were uh, spreading out. They, they were going all over the country to control things. And there was a uh, a welterweight boxer in Los Angeles named Don Jordan, who looked like he was going to become a champion. And he had a manager named Jackie Leonard. And Carbo and um, uh, uh, Palermo were threatening this guy that he had to sign over uh, Don Jordan's contract to them. He refused to do it. So they sent some thugs out to Los Angeles, and they, they beat the crap out of uh, uh, Jackie Leonard. He went to the local police, and the police wouldn't do anything. And so he went to the Justice Department, and the FBI wired him. And he had another meeting with, with uh, Carbo and Palermo. And they, he, he wired, uh, recorded all their threats uh, to, to him. And Robert uh, Kennedy uh, prosecuted 
uh, Palermo and uh, and Carlo and Truman Gibson and uh, Jim Norris, and they were all found guilty. Uh, Palermo was given 25 years in prison. Uh, I'm sorry, he was given 15 years in prison. Carbo was given 25 years. Uh, Jim Norris got off with a slap on the wrist because he was very wealthy and politically connected, and his uh, well, it, it, his um, ability to, to manage fighters was taken away. Uh, he needed a license to be a manager, and, and that was taken away from him. Uh, the same thing with uh, Truman Gibson. He, he, he was such a prominent a, a person and, and, and so important that um, he just got a slap on the wrist also. And I think his law license was temporarily uh, put on hold for six months and then it was restored. While they were in prison, uh, uh, Carbo and um, Palermo were still controlling part of boxing and they owned part of the contract of Sonny Liston. And Sonny Liston is, is a really sad case. He was born in real dire poverty. His father was a uh, sharecropper in, in, in Kentucky, and Sonny was one of 26 children by two mothers, uh, uh, and he was the second youngest. And his father used to beat him regularly with, with a bridle, with, with a strap, with a stick, uh, with, with anything. His whole back was scarred. He had those scars on his back for the rest of his life. And his mother uh, left uh, the father, the father's name was Toby, left uh, Toby and moved to Chicago. She was tired of being beaten up by her husband. And when he was 15, Sonny followed. And what he did is, is he, uh, he stole peanuts from a nearby farm and he sold them um, as a commodity to, to get bus fare uh, to Chicago. And he, he was totally illiterate. He had never been to school. He was enormous. He was a very big guy. And um, when he got to Chicago, he kept asking people if they knew where his mother was. And, and you know, the, Chicago was a big city. They wouldn't know. Um, and one night, uh, the police found him sleeping in an alley behind a restaurant where he used to uh, eat the garbage that was thrown out uh, from the restaurant to, to, to feed himself. And they found him sleeping in the alley. And they took him to the police station. They, they gave him a shower. They, they got him clean clothes. And they fed him. They got all the information that they could find out about him and his mother. And they were able to locate his mother and, and reunite them. And he moved in with his mother. But they, they, and they put him in the sixth grade in, in, in a public school. And he couldn't read or write. He was twice the size, maybe three times the size of any of the students. They were always making fun of him. And he felt embarrassed, and, 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 and so he quit school. And he, he became a, a member of a gang of kids, delinquents. And for some reason, they, they committed a lot of robberies. And for some reason, Sonny always wore a yellow shirt uh, when he was committing his robberies. And he became known as the yellow shirt bandit. And, and when the police were looking for him, all they had to do was find a kid with a yellow shirt, and they knew it was him. And he was getting arrested all the time. And, and th th these times, the cops were pretty rough on him. And, 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 and he resisted arrest while they, while they were rough on him. But he could get hit over the head three or four times with a billy club, and it didn't seem to bother him. Uh, I mean, he was just impervious to pain. And he, he eventually, he went to prison. And he was befriended in prison by a Catholic priest who decided that an outlet for his anger using his strength would be boxing. And he set up boxing matches for him in the prison with other boxers. And he, because of his strength, he knocked out anyone who got in the ring with him in the first round, usually within a few seconds of the first round. And, and to the point where boxers were frightened of getting in the ring with him. And when he got out of prison, you know, the mob, he, he had some uh, amateur fights and, and then turned professional. When he turned professional, the mob thought, you know, that this is terrific. We can make a fortune from this guy. So mobsters in, in St. Louis, Chicago, um, and Las Vegas, and Philadelphia all bought, bought uh, percentages in, in Sonny Liston's uh, career, and they controlled it. And um, he won every single fight up until his fights uh, with Muhammad Ali. And the uh, fight in, in uh, Florida 
uh, with Muhammad Ali. He wouldn't come out in the seventh round, and they thought that he was just giving up. And he said that he couldn't move his arm. It, it turned out that they x-rayed his, his arm, and he had bled from the shoulder into the bicep, and, and it was true that he, that he couldn't move his arm. <clears throat> there was another fight then scheduled, and none of the, majors, the mayors of the major cities wanted to fight in their city, not New York, not Philadelphia, not Chicago, not Boston. The only place they could find for a rematch was Lewiston, Maine. And, and um, the, uh, th th there was a lot of uh, uh, money being bet on uh, uh, Muhammad Ali to win, a lot of money being bet by the mob for Muhammad Ali to win, even though the mob owned Sonny Liston. And, and, and everyone wanted Muhammad Ali to win. Um, Kennedy brothers, uh, uh, John and Robert, they wanted him to win. They put Sonny Liston was bad uh, for the black community. The NAACP wanted Muhammad Ali to win. Congress of Racial Equality wanted Muhammad Ali to win. Um, uh, um, Roy Innes, um, um, James uh, Foreman, uh, all, all these civil rights leaders, they wanted Muhammad Ali to win. Now, there was a, a gangster in St. Louis named John Vitale, who owned 15% of uh, Sonny Liston's uh, career. And uh, John Vitale's underboss wanted to go to the fight up in Lewiston. And he said to John, uh, you know, I'd like to go to the fight. And, and, and Vitale said to him, don't bother. It's going to be over before you get there. And there was a, a gambler in uh, Las Vegas named Ash Resnick who also owned a piece of uh, Sonny Liston. And a friend of his said he was going to go up to Lewiston to see the fight. And Ash Resnick said to him, the fight will be over before you get into your seat. Don't waste the money on, on, on plain fare. And Geraldine uh, Liston, Sonny's wife, reported to the FBI after the fight. She said to him, I told Sonny, just lay down in the first round. If you're going to lose anyway, why stand there and get hit round after round after round? Die in, 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 in the first round. And he did. He, he went down one minute and 44 seconds of the first round. Uh, and, and, and people called it a, a phantom punch because most people didn't see the punch that knocked him down. And a lot of people sitting ringside didn't see the, 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 the punch. And when Muhammad Ali, you know, this famous photograph of Muhammad Ali standing over uh, Sonny Liston, who's lying on the canvas. Muhammad Ali is, is yelling at him. He's yelling. He's saying, Get up, sucker, get up, sucker. No one's going to believe I hit you. Get up. And, and, and when Muhammad Ali went back to his corner, he said to his corner men, he said, did I hit him? I don't think I hit him. Did I hit him? And, and, but Muhammad Ali never was involved in a fixed fight. He didn't have to be. But, but Sonny was. And the, the mob kind of dropped him afterwards, as they did with, with Primo Carnera in, 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 in the 1930s. He had a couple of more inconsequential fights after that. But then he turned on the mob. Uh, at first he was, uh, he, he was dealing heroin in Las Vegas and pinching on, on, a, on, a, on a gang's control of the heroin trade in, in, in Las Vegas. And a lot of people didn't know that he was taking heroin with Joe Lewis, who had become a, a heroin addict at, 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 at that time. And he also threatened to go to the Justice Department and tell them about the fixed fights and the, all the money that was uh, bet and, 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 and how he was never paid the money he was supposed to be paid. <clears throat> and his, his, his wife, Geraldine, was out of town for a while. When she came back, there were a lot of newspapers piled up on the front, uh, the front door of their house. She went inside, and she found Sonny uh, dead on, on the bed. Sonny had been frightened of needles his whole life. He was never vaccinated for anything. Yet, when the uh, coroner came, they found a needle sticking out of uh, a vein in his arm. And, and, and the medical examiner said that he had died of an overdose of heroin, which was called a hot shot of heroin. And, and, and the medical examiner surmised, without any proof, it was just based on, on an, an, an autopsy, um, that, that it seemed as if uh, Sonny had been drinking, and that, and that a drug had been put into his drink that knocked him out. And that while he was knocked out unconscious, two men who were with him 
who were drinking with him had injected uh, the overdose of heroin that, uh, that, that had killed him. And um, no one was ever uh, 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 prosecuted. Um, well, a, a, an interesting thing, going back to uh, Frankie uh, Carbo, uh, I'm, I'm currently writing a book about the history of organized crime in New York. And I, and I interviewed a, a lot of old mobsters and lawyers and so forth. And I found out from uh, uh, a, a, a former uh, mafia head in Philadelphia uh, named uh, Ralph Natale said that it was well known in the mob that Frankie Carbo had killed his best friend, Bugsy Siegel, in, in Los Angeles in 1947. He had been hired uh, uh, to, to do that. And, and it had been okayed by Bugsy Siegel's boyhood friend, uh, Meyer Lansky. Um, and um, so, so the, 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 the last chapter of my book uh, it, it deals with a Senate investigation in, 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 into corruption in boxing. And the, uh, the, their primary witness in, in, in this was uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano, who was in the witness protection program uh, at, at the time. And he had to testify truthfully uh, or jeopardize his position in the witness protection program. And he said that uh, boxing uh, fixed fights were not the same as they used to be. It, it changed dramatically because there was so much money involved in heavyweight championship fights, it would be 10 million, 20 million dollars uh, going to the contestants, uh, or the contenders. Um, he said, well, what we would do is we would find a boxer who we thought had the potential to become a champion, and we would hire a trainer to train him, and, and a manager to manage him. He wouldn't sign a contract with us, he'd sign a contract with the manager, and the boxer would never know that, that he was working for the mob or that the mob owned him. That, that the manager would know, and the manager would also hire the trainer. The trainer may or may not know. And, and we may even buy a boxing gym where we could control the entire environment. Um, and then we would bring this fighter along, and we would make sure that he had fights with people that he could beat. And then we would go to, now there are a number of sanctioning bodies. Uh, in, in the 40s and 50s, there was you know one sanctioning body to each uh, weight division. Uh, but now there are like four or five uh, sanctioning bodies in each weight division. And we would choose a, a, a sanctioning body, and we would pay them to rate our fighter as the top contender for the championship. And um, he went to one sanctioning body for, for this fighter that they owned, and they wanted $10,000 to make him a contender for the heavyweight championship. And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm asking you on behalf of John Gotti. And, and they said, well, as a courtesy to John Gotti, we'll reduce it to $5,000. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, and then we, we can also determine the outcome uh, uh, by a, a variety of means. And, and, and he wasn't too specific about that. Uh, but, but it had to do with fixing judges and, and um, especially if, if it looked like there wasn't going to be a knockout and um, making sure that the referee broke up the fight if it looked like uh, their guy was losing and didn't want him to lose. The, the senator said to, to, uh, to, to him what would happen if, if um, the guy you wanted to win got knocked down. Um, and, and he said, well, his opponent would know that he should go in there and pick him up. So, uh, so, 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 so because the guy has to win the fight, he, he can't be knocked out. I mean, he was making sort of jokes like that uh, 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 about it. And, and uh, when the senators asked him, um, you know, what, what could you do to prevent corruption in boxing? He said, the only way to do it is to reduce the size of the persons. He said, wherever there is this kind of money involved, the mob's going to be there. And, 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 and there's just no way of keeping them out. So anyway, that's the story of my book. If, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is boxing today, I, I haven't kept up with boxing in recent years, but is, is boxing today also influenced by the mob? It is. You know, especially the Russian mob. You know. there, there are a lot of Russian fighters out there. I'm going to
good opinion. Um, top down, um, down king. Um, and uh, he no must fight with proportion to Rome. Um, Can you repeat the question? He, he, he asked about a, a, a Don King, Bob Arum, and, and uh, Roberto Duran's no must fight, where he didn't want to come out of this corner. Ray Russell said that, that Roberto Duran just didn't want to fight anymore. He, he, he just had a complete change of heart. I mean, it was like he became a different person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and he said that he, in, in the training of Roberto Duran, you could see him becoming more and more humanistic as, as, as he went along. And he started out as a very tough young guy mm -hmm. and, and, and liked fighting. And, and by the time he was getting to the end of his career, he just didn't have it in him anymore. He, he didn't want it anymore. Um, my, my, my previous book was a biography of Rocky Graziano, and, and, and the same thing happened to him after he won the middleweight championship. He, he had been a very angry young man, and, and, and his anger was what motivated him to be a successful boxer. But after he became the middleweight championship, the champion, he just didn't have that anger anymore, and actually became a very compassionate, uh, uh, empathetic individual, and it was almost impossible that they, uh, to, to get in the ring and fight. Wow. Uh, uh, Bob Aaron wouldn't talk to me. Um, he, he, he's a, I, I, I spoke to other people who know me. They say he's a tyrant. Uh, um, and uh, I, I was going to mention something about Don King in my book, and I tried contacting someone. I reached somebody. I don't know um, what this person's position was or influence, but he said, Don King doesn't want to be in your book. Don't do it. Uh. And, 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 and there was an implicit threat in that. Oh, wow. You mentioned that uh, Muhammad Ali wasn't involved with the mob. No. How, did, how did he escape that? Did he have a choice? I mean, well, he, he, he was very connected uh, to, the, uh, to the black Muslims, and they were very strong, and they protected him. They kept the mob away from him. I mean, he would, and, and, and you know, Muhammad Ali was a very, very smart guy. Um, I, I, I'm friendly with uh, a man who's an architect who built the Muhammad, Muhammad Ali Museum in St. Louis. And he told me you know, stories about Muhammad Ali. He's just, he's the very bright, very funny, uh, very intelligent guy. Unfortunately, he was in too many fights. And the style of fighting, that rope a dope which permitted him to get hit in the head over and over again, Neurologists believe that that was the cause of his Parkinson's disease. Tara shook hands with him one time and he was shaking. Yeah. That hand was so big. He uh, was enormous. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, the the mob, uh, if you say, had patrolled uh, for uh, quite a number of years, perhaps still has, as you say. I'm curious, though, um, it would seem to me that, that Joe Lewis and Max Schmeli fights. Certainly, the mob could not do anything to Max Schmeli. He had the German government, Hitler, behind him. Was there any? No, they, they, they had a hard time controlling the, they didn't control all the, and that, that wasn't controlled. Um, th th there was some talk that, that um, Schmeli was permitted to win the first fight so there could be a rematch. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that Max Baer fought Max Schmeling in 1933, the first year that Hitler came to power. And uh, my father was at that fight. It took place in Yankee Stadium. There were 60,000 people there. And Max Baer was partially Jewish. His father was Jewish, his mother wasn't. And he had a Jewish manager. And, and, and Max Baer didn't know anything about Hitler. Hitler just came to power and so forth. And his manager, a man named Ansel Hoffman, told him what Hitler wanted to do to the Jews. And Max Beer decided to wear, a, to have a Jewish star stitched onto his boxing uh, uh, trunks. And he went out and slaughtered uh, Max Schmeling. You can see the fight on YouTube. Uh, I mean, the referee had to stop the fight in the 10th round because he was frightened that uh, Max Beer was going to kill Max Schmeling. Uh, I mean, from the beginning of round one, he just came out there and it's like a whirlwind uh, uh, hitting Schmeling. And Schmeling had no defense against him. It was just amazing. Um, Max Schmeling, unfortunately, got a bad rap as, as, as someone who was pro-Nazi, and he wasn't. He, 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 um, you know, during uh, 
famous crystal knock uh, when uh, they went against all the uh, Jewish stores and burnt the synagogues in, in, in Germany. Uh, Max Schmeling um, hit um, 12 uh, the Jewish teenagers in his apartment in Berlin. Um, and, and he also had a Jewish manager uh, named Joe Jacobs. And when Hitler demanded that he fire him, Max Schmeling said, no, I'm not going to fire him. And, 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 and there was a funny incident in, in Berlin in, in the mid-1930s, and Max Schmeling had a fight there, and he won. And um, he called Joe Jacobs into the ring with him uh, to congratulate him for winning. And everyone in the stands you know, gave the Nazi uh, salute, and, and um, Mike Jacobs didn't know what to do. He, he always smoked a cigar, so he, he put his hand up like that with his cigar in it, and, and in the news photographs, it looked like he was giving Hitler the finger. And Joseph Goebbels' uh, band uh, had all those photographs uh, removed from the newspapers. So, but but, but um, uh, also after, uh, similarly the way Primo Carnero went to, to the grave of Max Baer after he died, Max Schmeling, after World War, to went to Joe Jacobs' grave in, 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 in Brooklyn and, 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 and paid him respects that he was one of the best people I ever knew. I understand that uh, Matt Maxman paid for uh, Joe Lewis's funeral. That's possible. They were very good friends. Yeah. They were made very good. And, and Max Schmeling got the, uh, the rights to the Coca-Cola franchise oh, yeah. uh, uh, for, for all of Europe. He became a multimillionaire and lived into his 90s. Yes. Do you have any plans to do another book with uh, fighters like uh, Gavilan and, and uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and Patterson and no. Foreman? And, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm going to do another book of, at, at the current one I'm working on, which is about uh, uh, organized crime in New York. I'm going to do a book about uh, boxers, but it's a very special niche thing, and I don't want anyone to know exactly what it is until I do it. Because I don't want anyone else to get the idea. You don't want to give a hint. No, I'm not going to give. No, I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> uh, it, there, there was. Uh, I'm going from memory at this point, but uh, there was a fighter I think named Billy Kahn. Yes. Uh, uh, almost beat Lewis in '41. Right. I think he maybe caught Lewis flat-footed. He thought he'd have an easy job, a job tandem, but, and then. The war came, of course, and the next fight was, I think, 1946. And of course, then Lewis still had a lot enough. Or maybe was there mob connections behind that fight that uh, Billy Kahn didn't have a chance? Um, I don't know, but, but uh, I'm not sure if, if Mike Jacobs was still controlling Joe Lewis at that point. I'm not sure. It's, I'm not remember what year exactly Mike Jacobs had a stroke and, 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 and lost control of uh, Joe Lewis. But what happened is. Um, the people connected uh, uh, to uh, Carbo and Palermo uh, went to um, Truman Gibson, uh, Joe Lewis's lawyer, and they said, why don't we form a company called Joe Lewis Enterprises? Because Joe Lewis got to the end of his career. And, and, and we'll control the boxing. And we'll, and we'll be a promotion company that'll do all the, the, the boxing matches. And, and, and then they stole the company. Uh, and he, he just got screwed left and right. You, you, you know, he gave away, donated a lot of uh, money to the war effort in World War II, and, and a lot of the fights. You know, he set up, they had these fights called the, the Bum of the Month Club, and, and he donated most of the money from that uh, to, the, to the U.S. Army. And, and, and the IRS came after him after the war saying, well, you didn't pay taxes on that money. And, 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 and they took away almost everything he owned. Um, and, and he did it out of patriotism. He really got screwed. I mean, he was always getting screwed. It was terrible. Yes? Uh, Rocky Marciano, if I recall, never lost a fight. 49 fights. Was he, were any of his fights fixed? They didn't have to be fixed. They were all against losers. Uh, it, 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 including Joe Lewis and Archie Moore, uh, because they were well past their prime. I mean, Joe Lewis was a bold, flappy guy when he got into the ring with, with, with uh, Rocky Marciano. Archie Moore was in his 40s uh, uh, when, when he got into the ring with Marciano. There was, um, there was one fighter who put up a, a good fight against Marciano. His last name was, his name was Roland Lestarza. Uh, um, 
and, and came very close to, uh, to beating him. There, there is a story. There was a man named Harry Haft who uh, had been a, uh, a fighter in Auschwitz. Uh, he had to fight in order to stay alive. The, the, the Gestapo, uh, the SS, uh, made him fight on a regular basis. And if he lost a fight, he, he would be killed. So he had 70 fights in Auschwitz, and he won all of them. And, and he got out of Auschwitz, and he could have become a professional boxer. He, he had three fights in New York, and he won. And his next fight was with uh, Rocky Marciano. And mobsters told him that if he didn't lose, he'd be killed. Barry, Barry Levinson is making a movie about him right now. But, but, but uh, and, and after Marciano retired from boxing, he became a collector for the mob. <coughs> collecting okay. Yeah, collecting mob debts. He must have been efficient. He was very efficient. <laughs> he just looked at you and, and you wouldn't resist him. <laughs> he was also a cheapskate. Um, uh, 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 for my Rocky Graziano book, I, I interviewed uh, 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 Rocky's daughter, Rocky Graziano's daughter, whose name is Roxy. Uh, and she said that um, the two Rockies went out to Los Angeles to do a promotion television promotion and some other things. And um, uh, the entire time that they were out there, Marciano claimed he had no money, and Rocky Graziano had to, to pay for everything uh, for Marciano. And Marciano said he would pay him back, and he never paid him back. Whereas Rocky Graziano was a very generous guy. There was, you know, after he retired from boxing, he used to go to Stillman's gym to, to watch the up-and-coming fighters. And he saw off in a corner an old fighter who had gone blind, who was living in a transient hotel on the Lower West Side someplace. And he was on welfare. And Rocky went around to everyone in Stillman's gym and collected money from them, tens and twenties and fifties. And he got, gave some money himself. And he went over to, the, to this guy and he put all the money in his uh, shirt uh, pocket. And he said, I want you to come back every month. You're going to get the same thing. Rocky Graziano's wife had to put him on an allowance because she was frightened he was going to give away all of his money. <coughs> yes? Have you gotten any pushback uh, from the boxing industry to your book? There, there were a couple of boxing programs that have had me on for my previous books that wouldn't have me on for this one <coughs> because they didn't want to deal with the fact that mobsters are involved with boxing. I mean, it's an open secret, so I don't know why, but they didn't want to do it. It sounds like a lifetime of, of investigation and uh, gathering of information. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, uh, there's a reference librarian in East Hampton named Stephen Spataro, who, when I asked him to, if he could help me find old newspaper articles, and that, he's able to dig up anything I want. It's just uh, so I always acknowledge him in the acknowledgments of my of my books because he's been terrifically helpful. Uh, uh, the Floyd Patterson, do you think that that first, uh, that fight with Ali was in the mob involved? No, no, no but, but you, you know, who owned uh, 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 Patterson, A after the, the company that that, um, that Carbo and Palermo and, and, and those guys had uh, was forced out of business. And, and, and another company took its place called 20th Century Promotions. And that was run by the notorious lawyer Roy Cohn, uh, by uh, Fat Tony Salerno, who, who was uh, 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 a mafia boss in New York, and uh, a man named Bill Fugazi, who whose family was tangentially in, in, involved in the mob. You may remember Fugazi limousines. And, 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 and they controlled Patterson. They, they owned Did you say Fugazi? Fugazi. Fugazi. Oh. William Fugazi. F U G A C Y. Family also owned a, a, a private bank in Little Italy, which doesn't exist anymore. The, the uh, case of Floyd uh, Patterson, I, the uh, fights that with Ingemar Johansson, I, te I take it that. Uh, uh, Johansson caught Patterson out of a bad night with that, with that, that 
so-called punch. Patterson did not take a fall, did he? No. In that first fight, he just got a lucky punch. I think so. I think, I mean, he would, thereafter, I think the next one or two fights, naturally, he was wiped up. You know, uh, well, they had two fights, I think it was. Yeah. Was it two? Yeah. I think it was two, yeah. yeah um, in, in the mid-1980s, I was uh, uh, doing the publicity for a, uh, a welterweight fighter uh, named Howard Davis, who, who had been an Olympic gold medalist. He was in the same Olympics as uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. And he was a wonderful human being, just a delightful guy. And um, he used to train at a, a gym that's no longer in existence called the Times Square Gym, which was on West 42nd Street. And I used to go there and, and, and watch him fight, and then I would arrange for, for newspaper and magazine interviews for him. And I was talking to one of the characters who was hanging around uh, at, at, at the gym. He was a gambler, actually. And I, I, this was, I guess, for 1984, 85. And, and, and I said to him, you, you, you think fights are still being fixed now? And he said, oh, sure they are. And, and, and I said, well, how do you think they're fixing them? I said, do you think they're fixing the fighter? He said, no, we don't have to fix the fighter. We just have to buy one judge and that's fixed for us. <laughs> It was, it was like a character out of a, a, a guy's and dolls. Yeah. And, any other questions? Uh, anyone who wants to buy my book, I'll be happy to sell it to them and <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.